In this series, we are very slowly building a vacuum tube replica of the Motorola MC14500, which is a little one-bit microprocessor. Essentially, we're, we're trying to build a vacuum tube computer, which is kind of ridiculous, but it's been a ton of fun. Uh, so far, we've built a 4-bit instruction register, as well as some preliminary control for skipping instructions. And so next, I just I want to build the next piece in the puzzle, and that is the 4-bit decoder. So let's hop over to the bench, take a look at what the decoder is and how we're going to use it, and then we'll hop out to the garage, fire up the mill, maybe cut some circuit boards, and then give it a test at the end. So let's get to it. Before we can start just building the decoder, we need to take a look at what it is that it actually does first. And so this is the block diagram for the MC14500, which is the chip that we're trying to replicate with vacuum tubes here. And so far we've just built the instruction register here, which isn't actually all that much. And so the decoder is actually going to be what this uh, mystery box is here on the other side of the instruction register. And what this does is it takes the four bits that are stored in the instruction register and it breaks them out into 16 individual control lines. And each one of those control lines controls a different aspect of the system. It's a little hard to see what that means by just looking at this block diagram here, but we can kind of get a little bit of an idea. And so we can see that on IEN, OEN, and our output over here, you can see it actually just says IEN, OEN, STO, STOC. And so what these are are the individual control lines that are coming from the decoder down here. And so depending on what our four bits coming in are, we get a different one of those 16 control lines affecting a different part of the chip. But again, this is pretty abstract, so let's take a look at the actual gate level representation of the chip that we're trying to build. And this is not the official gate level representation of it. As a matter of fact, things are very, very differently built here than they are in the actual MC14500. And if you're curious about how the MC14500 itself is constructed and built, definitely check out a previous episode that I did working with Ken Schriff and Curious Mark and John McMaster, where we actually decapped the chip and took a look at the inside. But this gate level representation is just what I've been able to design based on how I know the chip should operate as well as some insights that we got from the actual chip itself. And I know it looks like there's a whole lot going on, but it breaks down into individual sections pretty easily. And so over here on the far left, you can see we have this massive collection of two input NOR gates down here. And you can see actually there's a repeating pattern going on. And these are the 4D flip-flops that we're using for our instruction register. And then the four OR gates that are feeding the data input to each of those 4D flip-flops is the initial part of our skip that we built in the previous episode. And the decoder that I want to build is this hilarious collection of four input NOR gates over here. And so you can see that the output and inverted output of each one of the D flip-flops for our instruction register goes into this massive collection of wires. And then there's a bunch of NOR gates that break that out into 16 individual steps. And so this is our basic decoder that we're going to build. But looking at it in this form with uh, all 16 lines coming out, is a little difficult to wrap your head around. I mean, I designed this and I'm looking at it and still going, I have no idea what's going on. <laughs> and so this design is taking four bits and turning it into 16 individual control lines. Uh, but to make it easier to understand, let's take a look at two bits and breaking those two bits out into four individual control lines. And that's what this is here. And you can see it's a lot easier to digest. Uh, essentially, we just have four NOR gates and then these two squares at the top are gonna to be our inputs. And then we have two inverters to take the input and give us an inverted version of that input. And so if we imagine that our instruction address is zero, zero, what that means is that the main input line is going to be low and then the inverted input line is going to be high. And then we have each one of these NOR gates hooked up to a different combination of the input or inverted input to give us the output that we need. And with a NOR gate, the way it works is that if both inputs are zero, the output is one, but if either or both inputs are one, the output is zero. So 
Since the inputs to our first NOR gate here are connected up to the uh, non-inverted inputs coming from our instruction here, that's going to be a 0, 0 being input into the NOR gate, which gives us a 1 on the output. But if we look at the other three NOR gates, they all have at least one line connected up to the inverted input. And so that means that at address 0, 0, all three of those will have a high level input going into them, which is going to pull the output low. And then if we go to address 0, 1, if we look at the second NOR gate, it's hooked up to the inverted input coming from the least significant bit and the non-inverted input coming from the most significant bit. And in this case, both of those are zero. And so zero one gives us that second control line turning on. And then you can see here that if we uh, change over to one zero, the lines illuminate like this, and that ends up with the third NOR gate turning on. And then if we have an input of one one, the lines look like this, and then that ends up with the fourth NOR gate turning on. And so in this way, using just NOR gates and a couple inverters, we can take a two bit address and break it out into four individual control lines. And this is the very same concept that we're going to use to break four bits out into 16 control lines. But doing that is quite an involved process. So before we do that, we should actually test this concept out. And so that's what this schematic here is for. You can see that we have four vacuum tubes set up here, and they're all set up as just two input NOR gates using two diodes. Now for the input, instead of using an inverter, I'm just using a little three position switch with 24 volts coming into the center pin, and then the left pin or the right pin will be our inverted or non-inverted outputs. And so there's a lot of lines going in a lot of different places, but it's actually a really simple design. I mean, you can see we just have a 33,000 ohm plate resistor. We have a 100 ohm resistor for the screen grid, a 4.7 thousand ohm resistor for the uh, control grid, and then uh, two 220K resistors to do our voltage divider network for the input. And then the output which comes off of the plate is inverted, and that's our NOR gate. So this looks to be pretty simple. So let's build it up on the breadboard and give it a quick test. All right, and here we go. We've got our four 6AU6s set up here, and they're set up exactly the same as this little schematic down here. And these two tiny little switches over here are going to be our inputs. And if the switch is to the left, that's a zero, and if the switch is to the right, that's a one. So right now, both switches are to the left, and so that's zero, zero. And so these four LEDs are going to be the four control lines that we're decoding into. And so when I turn the power on, uh, this first LED should stay on. So let's go ahead and flip the power switch and see what happens. All right, that was really interesting. We could see that there were different warm-up times depending on the tube. So this is a 6AU6A on the end, and then we have a regular 6AU6 here in the middle, and then we have a 6AU6WB here. Uh, now, I'm, I'm not including this one because, well, it stayed illuminated, so we don't really know what the warm-up time on it was. But the WB warmed up much, much faster than the other two. And the A actually warmed up quicker than the just regular 6AU6 here. So that's really interesting. We inadvertently managed to test filament warm-up times depending on the type of tube it is. Uh, now that they're all warmed up, you can see that all three LEDs are off and our first LED stayed on. So that's good news. So right now at zero, zero, we have the first LED on. So now let's try zero, one. Nice, look at that. The second LED came on. So that's awesome. We're decoding our address of zero, one to this second control line. All right, let's try one, zero. Yes, look at that, the third LED is on, and now the moment of truth, one, one. Boom, yes, all four of those work. So that's awesome, we're definitely just going to expand this design out, except it's going to get pretty big. So to decode two bits took four NOR gates. If we wanna decode three bits, we need eight NOR gates. And to decode four bits, we're gonna need 16 NOR gates. That's uh, growing pretty quickly. <laughs> Thankfully, we're not decoding eight bits, which would require 256 NOR gates. <laughs> uh, so this is also further affirmation that we made a good choice in going with a one-bit design as opposed to something like the SAP-1, which is an eight-bit design. <laughs> 
Uh, but this, I think, is going to work perfectly for what we're doing. So all that's left is to build it. So let's hop out to the garage, fire up the mill, cut some new circuit boards, and then we'll come back in here and give it a test. Here's where we left off last time. You can see this is essentially just the instruction register. These four rows of six tubes each are the 4D flip-flops that make up the instruction register. And then on the right here, we have a cathode follower buffer for both the output and inverted output of each D flip-flop. And then we have four little VFDs here to show us what is stored in the instruction register itself. And then all the way over here on the left, we've got the beginnings of a skip. This is essentially just a cathode follower OR gate. But I think we're ready to plug in the decoder board. So let's go ahead and slide those over and get them plugged in. That looks uh, completely epic. We've essentially just added another 16 tubes to this whole machine, and it's starting to get really, really wide. <laughs> Unfortunately, we still have more to go on the width, so the scale of this thing physically is going to be massive. Now these four boards look really, really similar, almost identical, but they're not quiet. And that's because this wide connector on the bottom here is eight pins, four of which are the outputs of our four bit instruction register and the other four of which are the inverted outputs of our instruction register here. So all eight of those options are available on each board, but how those connect up to the tubes themselves is slightly different. So to make sure that I put them in in the right order, I actually machined in a little uh, indicator on each board as one, two, three, and four. So that way I know that I'm putting them in the right place. So it looks epic. <laughs> I mean, it really does look very cool. Uh, but does it work? And um, I, I actually don't have a clue. I, I tend to test things before I put the camera on them. But I was so excited about this that I just pulled the camera out and, and put it together. So who knows? We may let the magic smoke out or it may work on first try. I'm hoping for the latter. Well, the only thing we can do now is uh, hook up a bunch of wires to it to test it out. All right, it, it definitely looks a little intense. I've got uh, uh, jumper wires kind of going in all directions. It's hilarious. <laughs> uh, so essentially what I have here is these collection of six wires here are the uh, 24 volts, minus 12 volts, and ground. And I've actually run double wires for them. I, I set it up in order to do that. Uh, when we were running just a single wire, it, we were drawing enough current and power that just one of these jumpers was not sufficient. And I'm actually a little worried that two is not going to be sufficient, uh, but we'll, we'll see how it goes. And then I have uh, my skip set up here, I have my 4-bit instruction coming in here, and I have my clock set up on this yellow wire here. And then on the output here, we've got uh, four groups of four wires going into this breadboard, which has 16 LEDs on it. Now on the final build, I'm not going to use LEDs. This is just for testing. So when I flip the power switch, a lot of really interesting things should happen. The tubes are going to start to warm up and everything is going to be pure chaos within the system initially. So we should see these four VFDs illuminate and fade out in some manner. 
Now the same is gonna go for these 16 LEDs over here. All 16 should illuminate, and then as the tubes warm up, 15 of them should fade out and one should stay illuminated. And that one should correspond to whatever chaotic state our instruction register decided to initialize into. I genuinely have not turned this on yet. I'm, I'm actually a little nervous. Uh, there's about a million ways it can go wrong and only one way it can go right. So we're kind of hoping that it goes right. So here goes nothing. All right, I think it's started to stabilize. Now logic low coming out of here should be about two volts and logic high should be about 20 volts. And so we can see that some of our LEDs are just barely illuminated. That's our logic low just kind of giving them enough juice. I'm using relatively large resistors, 22,000 ohms here. Uh, but I can see that there is one LED that is decidedly brighter than the rest. And that one is eight. Uh, and then if we look here at our VFDs, we have a zero, 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 and that one is illuminated, so that's a one. And in binary, one zero 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 is eight. So right now I've got all of my switches here set to zero, and I'm gonna hit the clock, and that should reset our instruction register to zero 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 zero, uh, which should then also illuminate this topmost LED over here. So let's uh, push that button and see what happens. Yes, <laughs> look at that, okay, wow. Uh, yes, our uh, topmost LED is illuminated here. All four of our VFDs are off. All right, so let's do the next step, which would be uh, 0001. Uh, that illuminated this VFD here, and we moved down a step on our LED down here. Awesome. Wow, that's really cool. All right, so I'm just going to run through all 16 permutations real quick. There's two, three, four, five, six... Seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, and fifteen. Awesome. <laughs> All sixteen LEDs illuminated at the right time in accordance with whatever four bit instruction was saved in our instruction register here. So our decoder here is working perfectly. <laughs> I'm gonna be honest, I didn't think it would actually work. So this is a huge boost in confidence from my ability to design things on the computer and then actualize them. <laughs> I am just super happy about that. And th what's great now is it's a perfect little space heater. So I can just hold my hands above it and I can feel the heat radiating off of it. So I'm not the best at math, but uh, this is a lot of vacuum tubes and each heater is rated at 6.3 volts and 300 milliamps. And right now we have 52 vacuum tubes in operation, uh, which is ridiculous now that I say it out loud. Uh, but if I did my Ohm's law calculations correctly, we should be drawing around 80 watts of power which is which is a huge amount for something that is so relatively simple. Um, now, I, I genuinely don't think we're pulling that much. My uh, little amp meter here is only showing that we're drawing about one amp. Uh, but regardless, this thing seems to be working beautifully, and it looks staggeringly good. Uh, I, I am just absolutely ecstatic with how this project is evolving. It looks epic. I am just blown away by how well this works, despite the fact that I am 100% winging it. I am just straight making this up as I go. But uh, the, the results are that I have my very own space heater that also happens to decode a 4-bit number into 16 individual control lines. So that is one more very important step done so thank you guys so much for watching. This has been an absolute blast, and we'll see you in the next episode.